Welcome to the Weekly Trend, a podcast for navigating the markets through the lens of technical analysis. The Weekly Trend podcast is provided for educational purposes only and does not constitute any professional advice. Listeners should not act upon the information or content without first seeking advice from a registered financial planner. Welcome back to the Weekly Trend podcast. Today is Friday, September 15th, 2023. S&P 500 currently sitting at 4452. I'm David Zarling. I'm here with Ian McMillan. We haven't been on the podcast together for some time. Great to be back shelling with you. It's shell. This is great. Yeah. Where would you like to start? I think there's a lot of important areas that we're bumping up against. You know, I know last week you guys did a good job covering the bumbling of the market, just kind of bumbling around within a range. When we talk about the S&P 500. Yeah, that didn't end this week, actually, inside, you know, NASDAQ, they pointed out S&P, IWM, of course, below last week's low because it's the blackest of the sheep right now. Yeah, NASDAQ and S&P still in last week's range. So no new major information there and at the same time we have some and this might be an overused term but i think it's appropriate for this episode there's a fair amount of inflection points you know we'll call them a confluence of important areas of interest across many instruments so you mentioned nasdaq and russell and s p all within last week's ranges but when we step back and look at something like a trade weighted dollar using dxy It's at an important horizontal level of 105. Mm -hmm. And that area, the reason why I can say that's an important area is in the past, that's where sellers have shown up, whether it was March of 2023 or January of 2023, sellers on a trade-weighted basis, that's where you saw the dollar weaken. It doesn't have to happen this time. But it would have ramifications if it did. If this is a horizontal level where sellers show up and sell the dollar again, that typically could be an environment where you see strength out of stocks. That's TBD. That is the general consensus. But I think stocks have been okay the last the dollar bottom July 14th. So you could say it's been a two month. It's rallied about five and a half percent. And stocks haven't, yeah, they're off their highs. I know we kind of peaked in stocks. I think it was later in July. Yeah. The most recent peak is late July. Has it been horrible based on, I feel like the mantra over the last two years, oh my gosh, if the dollar goes up, it's so bad. Like it's so bad for stocks. I mean, I still just think, you know, 5% rally. Um, Stocks are smallishly down. Yeah. And I think you've highlighted in the past that, yes, there's times where the dollar is weak and stocks are strong. There's also times where the dollar is strong and stocks are strong. So it goes in and out of correlation. But regardless, we've got trade weight dollar at a port level 105. We have long-term treasuries using something like TLT, at an important horizontal level that goes back to October, November of 2022. We'll call it the 92, 93 price level. The VIX being a Chicago Board of Exchange measurement for the volatility of S&P 500, currently sitting at an important $13 level. The higher the VIX, the more volatile that indicates S&P can be. I would also argue the higher the VIX, the the weaker the environment is for stocks. Yeah. You have a trade-weighted yen using something like FXY, not DXY, around 62. The yen is one of the more important currencies in the world. Kind of looks like bonds. Yeah, exactly. It looks like long-term treasuries at an important level. You have one of the leaders out of the October 22 low, from last year, ITB or home construction, 
important horizontal level near 82, let's call it 81. Yeah. Like to see that hold because that could be a consolidation. That's a area where buyers have supported that area going back to spring of 2023. And it's the highs from December of 2021. And that's not even the beginning of it. You know, what other areas are we seeing at important horizontal levels? So I just went through trade weighted dollar, trade weighted yen, treasuries, a volatility instrument like the VIX, a leader off the bottom in home construction. But that's not it. There's other areas that are important horizontal levels. Yeah. Bullishly speaking, I don't think that's a word, but it is for today. Yeah, it can be today. Energy. Okay. Back up near their highs from last June. So two Junes ago. That's crazy to think that we've gone sideways in energy for 14, 15 months. But, and that would be not all time highs, but definitely a big, yeah, if you, so XLE, if you look at, you know, the 90 to 92 range over the last couple of years, probably 92 more important, but 93, I guess. Yeah, yeah. XLE being Not the... bad. And I mean, when you look at the individual charts and breakouts, those lists continue to be heavily tilted towards energy stocks. Yep. It's an important horizontal level. This is where sellers have shown up in something like XLE, an ETF for energy in November of 22. May, June of 22, as you mentioned, and now will sellers show up again? So it's an important horizontal level. We see the same thing out of semiconductors, which remain in a range November and December of 2021 highs. We have one of the more important stocks in the world from a market cap perspective in Apple, mm. right? The highs from, I'll say it again, November and December of 21. It's currently sitting at that level after breaking above it. Yeah, I don't care for that. I think that that's a little. Yeah, it needs to hold this 173. It can, it can consolidate and maybe we wrap around 180, 182, 181, like you said. That would be best case. And again, I think we mentioned this at least last, or maybe two weeks ago. It is coming off a 58% rally. So. And you got to be practical in the grand scheme of kind of how stocks work. Got to be yep. thankful for that. And yeah, consolidation here would not be the worst thing. Now I say that with the caveat of, okay, if Apple's going to take a break, then what would you like to see? What would you like to see if Apple took a break? Rotation. I would like to see the Russell. Yeah, exactly. Do something. And this dude, Russell, man, will not get off the couch. <laughs> he will not get a job. He is just bumming it. And we stay stuck at this, for all intents and purposes, a very flat 200-day moving average. And we're back there today. We bounced off of there, you know, Wednesday and Thursday. We were just there in mid-August. We were here in early and late June. Cannot seem to get ourselves into an uptrend here with the small caps. It, we're right at the volume-weighted average price from the COVID lows. So going back all the way to March, April 2020, the weighted average price since then, the volume-weighted average price since then, we're right at that price. This 1865 on small cap futures, we'll call it 185 on IWM, an ETF representing small caps, and still within a range. Still within a very massive 20 percentage range, yep. depending on where you want to draw it. Yep. It's a lot. So it hasn't broken out of a bottom, a bottoming process yet. So, like when we talked about 4180 on the s p 500 which we did get above and broke above yeah that was breaking above a range we haven't seen that out of small caps micro caps we've actually seen uh further weakness and micro caps is just something we can measure for risk on or risk off behavior and that's on the lower part of its range that goes back to 
March and April of 2022. Yeah. And so here you're talking about, on one hand, you've got Apple, biggest name on the planet, needing to hold 173 to 175. You have micro caps on the flip side. You're, you know, you're really small market caps approaching a horizontal level that's important near 100, 102, 101. You have technology overall using something like XLK needing to hold the 176 area. I mean, there's so many going through the list again, trade weighted dollar, trade weighted yen, long duration treasuries, a volatility instrument like the VIX, semiconductors, energy, Apple. These are all at these inflection points in important areas. And it's going to be really interesting to see how this develops over the next two months because the back half of September and October are notoriously volatile and many times weak months of the year. So we don't get to be surprised if you know, something like the S&P 500, which had a, is having an inside week this, this week, meaning its trading range is inside the prior week's trading range. If its weakness continued into the second part of the month, and we head towards something like 4350 on the S&P 500, and that would be perfectly normal within the context of an uptrend. And that's the hard part of investing and being involved in markets is you can have these pullbacks and seasonal week periods, but they're perfectly normal in the context of the bigger picture. They are. Where would we be wrong? Where would that thesis of... Is the uptrend's over? Yeah. It's where would not we... just like a typical throwback, typical correction. Because I remember us having a conversation earlier this week where... I'll paint the picture above 4180. We've had this new up leg in the S&P 500, a resumption or, you know, a reestablishment of an uptrend, but it's the weakest response we've seen out of small caps in quote unquote, a new bull leg. Yeah. Like this far into what would in theory be a new bull market. However you want to measure that, you know, S&P is advanced X enough or whether it's a time interval thing. You know, stocks bottom last October, if we're really 11 months into what we would all like to deem as the next bull market, the next leg higher, yeah, you know, it's been a pretty abysmal start for, for the Russell. Yeah, I mean, the Russell is just less than 4% away from its January 1st opening price. Micro caps are actually negative on the year. You have this mixed environment of things that have happened. You've got long duration treasuries, negative on the year, aggregate bonds, negative on the year, micro caps, negative on the year, small caps, barely positive. But you got your big caps, right? You got your your big names are positive, but there's no question about it. Like they've had a great run. It's this narrowing process again. Narrowing meaning you take your whole universe of stocks and it's really your large caps that are holding up, which is what we saw at the end of 2021, summer mm -hmm. and fall and winter of 2021. You had a lot of stocks fall off. The mega caps hold up and that's kind of the environment we're in. And so we really need to see a rotation. We need to see a broadening out. I know we had that. Two eighty percent days just a few weeks ago, which some would define as a breath thrust. And now we need to see that hold. We do. And to your point, so year to date, mid-September, S P up. This is including today's being down one percent. SP up seventeen percent on the year. So quote unquote stocks up. 17 percent how many sectors do you think are above mm. year to date of the 11 sectors how many do you think are above seven above seven percent yeah return oh uh, boy out of the 11 okay i'm gonna say there's like 
three negative, three around 4%. I'm going to say less than half or above 7%. Yeah, only three are above 7% for the year. So that would be technology, I'm guessing discretionary and communication services. Yeah, and then all up, you know, more than 30. I'm not, I'm not whining. We all understand this is how the game is played. But just for some context around how, and you know, there's going to be, of course, everyone's, well, look at this stock from this industry. I can talk about PCG. We own PCG and ETF. I don't know if now this is going to have to be synced to compliance, but PCG has been a great stock and utilities as a whole are down 7%. So yes, there are these, you know, individual stocks that are doing fine or doing okay. And the sector as a whole is bad, but right, right. we all understand that you've got a broad market up 17% and probably 400 of those stocks are up less than 7% on the year. Right. So, so it's back to, and this is what cap weighting does. I mean, momentum and cap weighting impacts the performance of things overall totally get it i'm not i'm not here to say that that's not appropriate but to act like all stocks are doing what the s p 500 is doing is completely blind to what's happening underneath the surface which is a narrowing and that happens and we're in a weak period of the market now the tell in my humble opinion we need to see rotation and a broadening out in the final part of this year to carry the market higher. Some telltale evidence that we can look at is if semiconductors are breaking lower, right? Because you want semiconductors to do well, but if they're not, that's a warning sign. If you have a leader like home construction, ITB break below a range, that's a warning sign. Yeah. There's plenty of information that we can look at to see okay, what are the prospects of this market? Right now it's narrow and we want to see a broadening out. Whether that, not too hot. Oh yeah, solar's, yeah, solar. Let's talk about, you know, marijuana stocks rallying. I say congrats if you're overweight pot stocks coming into the league. Uh, I was not because they're down a bazillion percent in the last two years. So Ian, obviously, you know, you're not doing your job if you're not owning pot stocks because they're up you know, 70% in a few weeks, which well, still is my bad. Cause if you think about it, if you're down 99%, I mean, it's a pretty good risk reward, Dave, to enter. <laughs> like, Cause you can only, if you can only technically lose 1% on a trade. Yeah. That's then, exactly how compounding works. I know I should have, I should have caught this pop in the, in the yeah. cannabis stocks. Think about this. Even after a 60 to 65% rally in pot stocks, they're still down 87% from their high. And and that will, and for some clients that listen to this, that will blow their mind. Like, wait a minute, how does something rally 61% but is still down 87%? And that's that compounding effect that, right, if you lose 50%, you have to have 100% return to get back to even. So just to get back to, its previous highs using something like YOLO, Y O L O, you have to have an 1100% return, 1100% return just to get back to even from here. That's doable. You never know. I mean, it, it probably is going to take a while, but you never know. I'm not here to tell the market what to do and what not to do. Man, we got, some, Dave, we got ugly charts out there. There's just things that you'd like to see do better. Yeah, do you have any examples of that? Tech. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. What's interesting? I think it can't consolidate up here, but if yeah. falls into the failed breakout category. Yeah, let me roll this past you. So I'm not saying tech is gold or gold is tech, but when you look at gold on a big term perspective or longer term perspective, right? You have this range that's in place from May of 2020 through now. Let's call it between 1650 and 2000. 
it's wrapping around that range is wrapping around the high from 2011 is XLK doing the same thing where it's creating a range between 165 and 180 let's call it 180 that wraps around the high from December November December of 21 it could be hope so yeah that would be the best case scenario right that we're consolidating we're wrapping around the prior high and then we move higher but really XLK below 165 that's a big warning sign yeah, if you're trying to retire in the next couple of years, you probably don't want XLK to break down here. Not yep. significantly, at least. Right. Which matches up with Apple at 175. You want to see that hold. Could it come back in the 200-day? And some of this might just be reversion, 200-day. Absolutely. Day. Nothing's broken. No. There's some teetering going on. Yep. There's some teetering on the cliff edge where I'd like to get away from that. well and we're heading into this area mm -hmm. september and october are notorious like when you look back at the history of markets october is when corrections like when corrections can accelerate and so yeah. it's worth paying attention to we know that august september october seasonality wise are weak we perfectly understand that the market has been weak during this period. We're building a range. October could provide some clues, right? Because like, for example, October 2018 is when we saw an accelerated move to the downside. And we'll have clues for that, though. It's not like you're flying blind. You know, if you're seeing ITB or construction breaking below this $80 level or breaking below its 200 day moving average, or you see semiconductors breaking below important levels, that's going to be important information. So yeah. we'll see, we'll see as time goes on. Um, as we think about, you know, I know we didn't talk about Bitcoin. We don't have to talk about Bitcoin. We can. This 25,000 level is pretty important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, I mean, it's a pretty clear line in the sand. One thing we haven't touched base on is just commodities. Commodities. So you think about a relationship between stocks and commodities. That's important to pay attention to. It wasn't that long ago. And I say not that long ago because I let's define it as greater than 12 months. Let's put it this way. The first quarter of 2022, commodities carried the water while the market was correcting. It was this this great time where commodities led stocks were weak bonds were weak do we see an environment like that in the next few months where commodities start to lead again because when you look at it like a relationship of commodities versus stocks there's information there that we should be at least paying attention to that hey we might see a resumption of commodity upside are there commodities that you're looking at ian that might indicate that there are both as a whole. And I think it was Dan, I think Russo had a good chart on this. Someone did where they were tying it back to 2007. Okay. Like if you look at crude in 2007 and how it kind of has this correction. So this, like summer, July, August correction in 07. Okay. And how that kind of led to the next upswing in commodities. I mean, this one's crude corrections gone on. But I, I mean, I do think it's been fascinating to watch another thing that i think is so fascinating and i shared this on twitter i'm not saying that it's fascinating because i shared it but what's been happening lately in the markets led me to go look at this and that's the dollar and crude moving in the same direction because right that's not the typical textbook belief things denominated in dollars should go lower if the dollar is moving higher but this is actually the longest 
positive correlation in the dollar and crude since like the early 2000s. Oh, you're just saying the dollar rising, crude rising. And crude rising. Like we rarely ever see this happen, especially ever this long. I was looking at the six month correlation, which I think gives a good picture of. Sure. Like longer trends versus, you know, something shorter. But yeah, we've really have never seen anything. So mid 80s, they both went down for a while. Early 2000s, they both went up for a while. And then here in the last, you know, 2022, 20, into 2023. And so I can't tell you the dollar is affecting. Maybe the dollar is having an effect on oil, but the demand in oil is just that strong. Like maybe with a negative dollar, we'd be at $102 a barrel in crude. I have no idea. I don't want to hop on that macro train. But yeah, I agree. I mean, if you look at like a DBC or what's the other one we like, GCC? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those on an absolute basis for sure seems like it wants to, you know, come out of this base. And then on a relative, certainly, certainly fascinating. I mean, I think, right, I don't care really what the White House or the Fed says, I think. The average American would say inflation is still pretty strong in their day-to-day lives. So, yeah, if we see commodities come well, back, this, I don't think it's a huge shock. This brings back a buzzword from a few months ago, maybe more, inflation. Inflation. Remember so, when inflation was transitory? <laughs> Remember that? Like Janet Yellen and... And everyone said it would happen. We get, we did the stimmy checks and we did the, you know, print money and send it to, you know, wherever across seas we want to send it to. Um, just yeah. wild, the things that went on, of course. Well, and it brings up the tips, right? The tips. When we talk about it, swinging back to horizontal levels of interest that we talked about, like you look at something like TIP and ETF for inflation protected treasuries. Infl- this, these are supposed to protect me. Right. From inflation. Yeah. And it's at an important horizontal level. So it's another instrument that's at an important horizontal level. And Do you so feel like they've done their job. Oh, no. No, I don't. It doesn't seem like they'd have. Right. Now so, you're DILs of the world. And your floating rate. If, yes. Those have done just fine. But the point being that could you see a resumption in inflation, which I haven't heard anybody talk about, but yet you look at a fair amount of charts and we know that inflation is heavily influenced by energy pricing. And you look at things like coal, uranium, gasoline, oil. These all are all setting up out of consolidations that have gone on for yeah. two plus years. Are we going to see a resumption in costs for energy? You look at agriculture using something like DBA. And I'm not sure if it's ETF or ETN, but bear with me. DBA breaking out of consolidation. Are we seeing a resumption in agriculture pricing? Yeah. Moving higher. So just when everybody thought inflation was behind us, because I, pardon me if I'm wrong, and maybe I've been living in a hole, but the inflation narrative has gone away. It's definitely gone away. And do you remember last Q4, all the net gas talk and how bad of a winter it was going to be for Europeans? Because I think they use a lot more net gas to like heat their homes and stuff than we do. And then that gas just like fell off a cliff going into like Q4. 2020 2022 and that narrative kind of when i remember all the like graphics about like all oh, the average european is how much it's going to cost them to like heat their like house this winter so it'd be interesting if it came back this year considering no one's talking about it if this would be, actually be like the winter where uh, and then you've got sugar futures which are yeah 
breaking out to new highs. Obviously, sugar and nearly everything in America. So <laughs> in America, for sure, we know that that will likely have an impact. Well, so you got natural gas, you got oil, agriculture, a fair amount of it. I'm not saying wheat or corn, but there's some. Do we see a resumption in inflation overall? That's TBD. You know, you look at rates, which tend to be related when we think about inflation, right? As inflation rises, you typically see the cost of money rise. And here you have 10-year treasury notes right against, again, important horizontal levels near the 4.3 level on something like a 10-year treasury note yield. If you look at a longer term, like a 30-year, right up against 4.4. And whatever happened to the inverted yield curve? Remember when that was the talk of the town? You're talking about twos versus tens. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting when we look at that relationship, twos versus tens, we're still in this horizontal range that goes back to surprise, surprise, near the bottom in October. So we've kind of moved flat in the in what would be dividing the U.S. two-year yield, treasury yield versus the U.S. 10-year treasury yield. We've been flat since that period of time. Do we become less inverted? That's to be determined. Are we in an environment that we're in the next 40-year cycle of rising rates? The evidence continues to stack up for that, for sure. Yeah, I think we're... I mean, every week and month that goes by, the uh, case for that only builds, it seems. Yep. It's an interesting time where the 60-40 portfolio, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, I would make the argument that that has been broken since the COVID lows. I don't know how long advisors, other advisors will be married to that type of portfolio makeup, but I know that that has impacted portfolio performance I don't if even it's know if a, we have a 60 40 anymore. What do you I mean? mean what, a benchmark, but oh, right, 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 correct. Like, like it, I don't know, it hasn't owned bonds for going on. You're just saying our internal models haven't owned bonds like, like that way in a long time. A, I don't know. We own some Over emerging years. Yeah, we own some emerging market other than like local. the BIL type stuff. I'm talking about, yeah, like long duration for sure, like bond bonds, right. And it's because of this situation where we're in a downtrend in long duration bonds, whether you're looking at treasuries or aggregate, it is interesting to note that something like junk bonds versus seven to 10 year treasuries has broken out of a level, is moving higher. That's risk on behavior traditionally. Yeah, but junk think- bonds look a lot better on a relative basis. I mean, they've been in an uptrend since, you know, with stocks since October, last October. So I guess that's pretty, yeah, pretty solid. So at this point, Ian, what I'm going to do, we're kind of up against our time. Is there anything else you want to cover? And and part of this is we're up against our time, but my battery on what we're recording on is also up against our time. Is there anything you want to cover before we sign off for the weekend? No, no, I think pretty mixed. I don't have a lot of. You know, good or bad things. The, you know, Apple will be the chart I continue to keep an eye on the most, probably, at least for the next few weeks. Yeah, for that 175 area. Yeah, trying to, you know, are we going to consolidate or is this going to, if Apple goes down, that's a massive headwind. Yeah, because it's the biggest contributor. It's your all star. Unless. Like unless small caps are just going to really step up the plate, it's like if Aaron Rodgers goes down like on your team, it's really hard for the perform. Weeks, yeah. If Apple's rupturing an Achilles tendon, it's really hard for the market to move higher, and that's that's just kind of the reality of the situation. Is you want to see Apple at least consolidate and see some rotation? That would be the most ideal scenario that yeah. Ian's highlighting. But here we're in an environment where we see. Inflation protected securities at a horizontal important level. We've got oil moving higher. 
natural gas moving higher, long-term duration treasuries at an important horizontal level, the dollar, trade weight dollar, important horizontal level, the VIX, a measurement of volatility at an important horizontal level, trade weighted yen at an important horizontal level, home construction, semiconductors, energy, Apple, Bitcoin, technology, Russell futures, all remain at important horizontal levels. This is where we see polarity. This is the interaction of supply and demand. After all, that's what we're studying. We're not here to have the latest opinion on whatever Jerome says or whatever China's doing. We could care less about that. We care more about what are the actual buyers and sellers of equities, treasuries, bonds, commodities, crypto, what are they actually doing? And NYSD are, also at a big level, I think that yeah. 16, whatever that is, 16,000 or 16,100 ish. Yeah, exactly. Like these are pivotal levels and we're at important piece of time from a seasonal perspective, September and October. And it's going to require patience to let these resolve. If important horizontal levels are being broken to the downside, our clients will know that more protective measures will be taken. At the same time, if we're moving higher during a week's seasonal period, that bodes well for November, December, January coming up. And so part of this is you have to wait for the information to come in, but we are at important levels across many different instruments. When we just look at the S&P and NASDAQ and Russell 2000, we remain within an important range compared to last week. So it's a combination. Are we still stumbling and bumbling? From a indice perspective, absolutely. These other instruments that we just labeled at important horizontal levels that we want to pay attention to as we head into a really weak seasonal period, the last part of September, we don't get to be surprised by weaker equities during that period and October as well. So we'll continue to monitor that situation and stay on top of it. Ian, I love being back on here with you. I really appreciate it. You always do such a great job. And so thank you for me being back on here. Yeah, great episode. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Have a good weekend, everyone.